Uh, next interview is with Heather O'Donnell, who is a new bookseller who just got into the association in October, but is not a new bookseller. Uh, her name of her place is Honey and Wax, but it has nothing to do with bees, which I found out. So, like I ask everybody, why don't you tell us something about your, your parents, siblings, uh, what they did, uh, education, uh, et cetera, and then you can go and talk about the things you talk about on your home page, which is you know short bio. So just go. Great. Well, uh, I grew up in suburban Delaware. Uh, my parents were both urban planners. Uh, I'm the eldest of three children. Uh, from the time I was very little, I was just a big reader. Um, and beyond being a big reader, I just loved books and just accumulated them. I certainly didn't collect in any way, but I, I loved them. It was always, whenever I could be in bookstores, um, some of my favorite memories are being you know, a grade school kid in the bookstore at the mall or the used paperback shop down by the university. I loved those places. Um, so uh, you know, I always had a real interest in literature um, and uh, went to Columbia University um, and was an English major there and was very set on becoming uh, a professor of literature. Um, and so I pursued that with a kind of single-minded, eldest child kind of, <laughs> kind of discipline. Uh, and uh, when I graduated Columbia, I went to Yale, got a PhD in English, and then I was a fellow in the Society of Fellows uh, at Princeton University for three years. Um, so I had a, a very, you know, a very direct kind of academic path. But the whole time that I was doing that, I was always doing all these bookish things on the side just because I liked it so much. When I was a graduate student, uh, I worked as a curatorial assistant at the Beinecke Library with Patricia Willis in the Yale Collection of American Literature. So I learned a lot um, just running around the stacks of the Beinecke for a few years, uh -huh. answering uh, you know, correspondence and questions, and, um, and really learning firsthand how to handle that material and how to think about it as a historical artifact. Um, and before that, even when I was in college, I worked at the Strand, um, you know, on the floor, just looking at that deluge of books coming in every oh, day, God. trying to, you know, pick through them and figure out what's good and what's not, um, buying paperbacks off the street all the time. You know, it was always something that I just really loved and was kind of in the background of my life. Um, in my early 30s, when I was at Princeton, I realized that I did not actually want to be a professor. Even though that is what I had always thought I wanted to be, I still loved reading and writing and teaching, but I just didn't, I didn't enjoy um, academic writing very much. I didn't want to be on committees. I just, I just didn't, didn't realize that wasn't actually maybe what I wanted to do, but I felt a bit at a loss because that's what I had trained my entire life, very hard to do. Um, and I received uh, an email the last semester that I was at Princeton from a headhunter who was looking for someone to work in a New York, unnamed New York rare book gallery. And I just put it, I didn't delete it, but I also didn't really open it. I just kept it in my inbox mm -hmm. thinking, one day I'll open that. <laughs> uh, and, and then I did. And it was from Bowman Rare Books, an ABA member of you know, many decades, um, looking for someone to work in the Madison Avenue gallery. And on the one hand, I thought, that's crazy. You can't throw over your academic career to go work in a bookshop. But I had just had a, a baby. And I really did not. There were no academic jobs in my field in the New York area that year. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm on sort of maternity leave anyway. No one's really going to know if I go in and you know, do a little something. We can play around. And um, David Bowman was so generous and said, you know, you can pump here, we'll set everything up, just come in one day a week, see if you like it. If you don't like it, no one needs to know. It's just, you know, come on in, give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, and so that summer, the summer of 2004, I started working there one day a week. And that fall, I went full time mm -hmm. at Bowman and I found that I really enjoyed the book trade. I enjoyed it, you know, in just a really, um, just deep and uncomplicated way that I, I just found it so endlessly fun and enjoyable and all the anxiety that accompanied my academic career just sort of disappeared. And I thought, no, this is actually great and you can make this what you want to make it. You, know, you can pursue your own interests without fear of, of anything, you know, of it not being marketable enough or you need to slant it this way or you need to appeal to these people. Instead it was just, you know, your interests are as wide as the whole history of the printed world. 
and you can pursue it. So that was how I came to Bowman Rare Books, and I worked in that gallery for seven years. Seven years. Seven years, and it was a terrific, terrific experience. Great, um, you know, I got to travel, I got to look at all kinds of collections, you know, institutional and private. Um, you know, I got to go to all the big book fairs, I got to go to important auctions. I just, you know, it was such a wonderful place to learn the trade. Um, Especially because people just walked in off the streets of New York all day with you know their yeah. knapsacks full of books and dumped them on the table, and uh, you know in the beginning I wasn't sure what to say, but you know, after a few years, you develop an eye, you see you see what you like. So that was great. And another thing that was really liberating for me about that was that, you know, in my academic life I felt like the walls were closing in, like I became more and more specialized, and I was constantly you know anxious that I was missing you know an article in this field, or felt guilty if I read something that wasn't related to my academic research, or you know, and so to come from that atmosphere to a generalist like Bowman, where on a given day you know it could be about polar exploration, it could be about Audubon, it could be about presidential signatures, could be about the Civil War. You know, every day was sort of a new learning curve and something else to do. So that was also really, really um, a pleasure for me. Um, and, and I enjoyed it so much. So that was my, my training in the field. Um, after about five years, I did begin to feel as though my love for literature had never flagged. And that is really what I care most about, what I know best, what I'm most drawn to. Uh, and I began you know, to feel like I would like to spend more of my time working on the books that I really enjoy. Yeah. But um, you know, that obviously in a kind of generalist gallery situation is not a luxury that you have, and you can't ask everyone else to take the other things you don't want to do and just focus on you know, this, this narrow thing. So I began to think that probably the next step for me would be dealing for myself and, um, and starting my own company, um, which was uh, very exciting, but also, again, kind of not something I'd ever thought of myself doing. And, um, you know, I, I have been a single parent almost the entire time, so I had, you know, my daughter at home, and uh, the prospect of giving up a very stable, steady, yeah. comfortable position um, that afforded us a very comfortable life um, to deal books out of our walk-up apartment in Brooklyn seemed like maybe not a great idea. Um, and I remember my father, you know, with a stricken expression on his face Ooh, yeah. when I shared this, this idea, and saying, you know, are you sure there's, is there maybe another dealer you would like to work for? And I said, it's, it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with my not, in, you know, not liking my, my current position. Right. It's just that I feel like I have to now do this for myself. And really it's, you know, that's, that's what it's about. Um, and so, uh, so that, that it, I would say it took me about two years to get years psychologically to, yeah. in the place where I thought, we can do this, you know, and I saved up and I talked to my daughter who then was, you know, somewhat older. She's now, um, I mean, she was at that time, uh, you know, six years old, seven years old, old enough to understand that, you know, if, uh, if we start our own bookshop, um, that it'll be exciting, but it also means things around here will change somewhat. And, um, you know, some things that we've become really accustomed to doing without thinking about it, we're, you know, we're just going to save a lot more money and, and not do those things for a while. Um, but she was always such, uh, such a support and such an inspiration to me in the whole process. She loved the idea of us having our own, our own <laughs> thing, even if it was just in our dining room, you know. And I remember when I got the first bookshelf, first Honey and Wax dedicated bookshelf, you know, she sat on the floor with me and passed me all the screws and bolts, you know, we put it together. <laughs> together, she was always very, very, you know, bullish and, and confident, even when I was not always super confident <laughs> that I was making the right decision. Yeah, you you um, never know. Do you? You, know, you don't know. You really you don't. don't. Um, so in, uh, in 2011, I uh, you know, tendered my resignation at, at Bowman. And David and Natalie Bowman were extremely supportive and extremely. They um, understood. Yeah, they're very, very um, you know, sorry to see me go, but they understood the, the situation. and, and um, have been you know, big supporters of mine from the beginning, so that was great, good feeling. Um, and, uh, and I bought a small stock of literary books um, and started you know, putting together a website and planning for a catalog. And, um, you know, and just 
letting people know that, that now I was going to do, to do this thing. So that was how Honey and Wax Booksellers started in, and that was the fall of 2011 that I left. And then the website launched in the February, actually almost exactly four years ago, February 2012. So, um, so that, was, that was how I came to be Honey and Wax. Okay, how many items do you think you have in your inventory? I have about 250 you know, items in the office, and about half of those are cataloged and online and available for sale, and then the others are either slated for someone in particular, and, you know, or they um, have yet to be cataloged or dealt with, or they're waiting for, some, for me to do something to them. So, um, so it's, a small, it's a small stock. Are you gonna increase it? Are you gonna I, that, is, that is my goal. Um, That's probably why you're here. That, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I wanted uh, to, uh, yes, I am going to increase it, and that is, you know, something I gradually work on. Um, I'm, you know, I'm lucky because, uh, you know, the, the collectors that I have met and have cultivated, you know, they, they usually buy what I have in mind for them, so a lot of what becomes my stock are the, you know, the occasional misfire, where right, I think, oh, right. that, didn't, that didn't work, but that's fine. Someone will like it. It's still a good book. Um, I haven't had as much time just to buy in a general way for stock as I would like, but that is, that is changing, and I feel like we're getting, we're getting better. And as the database grows, you know, I'm, I'm better able to, I don't have to catalog every single thing from absolute scratch, which was the case in the beginning. Yeah. So, um, so that's good. And, you know, I do offer all my books are, you know, they're fully cataloged. I, I don't, you know, I don't just have shelves of things that, you know, kind of come in and out, that sort of thing. I, you know, it's not an open shop, so. So you were, you were yeah. still working from your apartment? Or? I was working from my apartment, and um, I did that for a year and a half. Um, a year and a half? Yeah, no, actually two years. Um, and in the beginning, that was great. I mean, it was also necessary because I yeah, didn't have any money. So <laughs> that was, um, so you know, we started in the dining room, and then gradually, things began to sort of colonize the apartment. We had the yeah. dining room, but then we had some of the kitchen cabinets. Then the folios were under the bed, and then there were stacks of things. And um, the second Christmas season, our first Christmas season was fine, but our second Christmas season. Um, we couldn't actually eat in the dining room for yeah. about three weeks before Christmas because the whole table was just covered with books, you know, carefully placed stacks of books that needed to go, you know, be shipped in particular ways or wrapped. And, um, and after that, I, I said, you know, I think that we are going to have to change this up because I would like to have our home back. Right. Um, and so uh, I wound up, uh, actually, it, it turned out very serendipitously, I had always used, I, I never wanted to use our home address as the mailing address of um, Honey and Wax. So from the very beginning, our mailing address had been in my neighborhood, a local co-working space, the Brooklyn Creative League, um, which, and I just had used it as the address. They would hold things for me, stuff could be delivered, and they had a shipping room so I could ship stuff out of there oh, when cool. I wanted to, so it was great. Um, and I, you know, I'd sometimes come and work there just at an open desk or that sort of thing. Um, in uh, 2013, uh, a small office opened up there and they asked if I would be interested in moving in. And, uh, and it seemed great because I, mean, I didn't have to get new letterhead or anything. Right. We just, yeah, we just moved, yeah, just, just uh, moved about a mile, you know, all the books out. Um, so I you know, got a man with a van and, and we packed it all up and sent it over. And, and having the office has been an incredible you know, boon in every way, um, in part because I've had more space to get more books, but um, oh, you know, also just having all the shipping supplies out of the house, just having, you know, a, more of a separation having between work and home. Table. Having, you know, being able to eat dinner yeah. at the table. Which is a good instead, thing. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's what I want in the big picture. I want, I want my dining room to be my dining room and my office to be my office. So, um, so yeah, so in 2013, we got, we got the space. And then the thing that, you know, I probably, people who have never met me, if they know anything about Honey and Wax at all, you know, it, it is my catalogs, which I have worked really, really hard on. So um, we've issued one catalog a year for four years. Um, and from the very beginning, that was where I kind of poured my resources. I really wanted to have very, very distinctive, very mm -hmm. beautiful print catalogs. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's, we've issued four of those, and, and that was um, where I spent, I would say, the, you know, I mean, I like my website, it's, it's nice. Did you um, but it was Who the, designed it? Was it? The, uh, the website and the catalogs, actually everything for Honey and Wax is designed by a Brooklyn designer named Bridget Cabri-Nelson, uh, who has a 
her, her own company is Letter Shop, but actually after doing my website and collaborating with Bibliopolis on that, Bibliopolis wound up bringing her on as yeah. sort of, you know, a uh, designer in-house too. So she also does other people's websites yeah. as well. She's got a great eye. She has a good eye. Yeah. That, that's the most important thing. Um, so what percentage of your business is done through catalogs and what percentage is done from uh, your internet presence? I mean, internet is not very big for me. Okay. I do get, you know, I do get web orders, and of course I keep my books on Biblio and ABE, and I have my website up. So, you know, I mean, truly, you know, uh, every week I might sell a book or two online, and that's a nice thing to have in the background, but the real engine of my, you know, business is dealing directly with collectors and institutions and selling things, you know, with them in mind, purchasing and, and directing it to them. Um, so it's, uh, the website is almost more fun for me than it is, but it's, I, I could never live on what it sells. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, do you plan to do uh, book fairs at yes, some point? Yes, I do. Um, up, well, I'm gonna have my first ABA fair uh, in New York in two months, it'll be um, the, April 2016 New York Book Fair will be my armory debut by myself. I did that fair, of course, with the Bowmans for many, many years. Oh, yeah. But, um, you I'm know looking your way forward around to, I know, I know my way around the fair, but I'm really looking forward to, uh, to having my own there. I mean, up until now, you know, because I had to wait four years to apply for right. ABA membership after I left. Um, so during that time, you know, I did the shadow shows in New York and Boston around those fairs, and I do the Greenwich Village uh, Antiquarian Book Fair every year. Um, I've been doing the Brooklyn Fair that Marvin Getman has organized the past yeah. two years, which I am a big booster of and excited about, of course. And then for the past four years, I've also organized a small book fair in December in Brooklyn every year, um, which started off in uh, my first Christmas season just because I didn't have anything to do. And <laughs> I thought, you know, well, maybe we could like have a little book fair. And so <laughs> I, uh, I invited, you know, other Brooklyn bookshops and that kind of thing. And, and we put it together and Pete Hamill agreed to read his new Christmas book. So we did that. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, you know, it was really fun. And then it just kind of became a thing that happened uh, every December. And so the second year, you know, we had more booksellers and we had Paul Auster and, um, the third year we had Mara Kalman, and last year we had Adrian Tomine. So we always have like a Brooklyn writer come and, and do something. Um, and it's been really fun, although I do think that probably I'm going to have to stop being the organizer of that. If it's going to continue, it's going to have to be someone else because well, now I have more to do. <laughs> your hands are going to be full as an ABAA person. Yeah. And so uh, you'll be able to do as many shows as you want, obviously, but your time is going to be your enemy. It's well, it's true. I definitely do feel um, like, you know, in the beginning, I just, I mean, you know how it is when you, you start off, there's just not, I was so used to working in this environment where there were, you know, the phone was constantly ringing and people, people were constantly were walking in and, you know, there was always, you know, so much to do um, to, you know, being in my apartment with a little shelf of books, sort of, you know, phone was not ringing off the hook, <laughs> you know, there was, uh, it was definitely, uh, you know, a big, a big change. Um, and now, you know, I mean, gradually, the phone does ring now every day, not every hour, but multiple times a day, the phone does ring with something, so that's good. Um, but it's still not, you know, it's not that kind of, that kind of yeah. thing. And so obviously, I want to take it to the next level, level, and that's what joining the ABAA and doing the ABA fairs is, is, you know. Well, it's, it's opening you, you to a market that perhaps you could never reach any other way, I don't know. But it seems like uh, the armory fairs attract practically everybody in the area who's interested in any kind of book, so. Yeah, I'm really, um, really excited about that. Um, so I'm here, you know, at the California fair. I'm not exhibiting at this fair, but I'm here in large part to buy things yeah. um, for the armory show. <laughs> so, yeah, really, because you, you know, it's not gonna be cheap exhibiting. No, no it's not cheap to exhibit, and you want to have things that will earn back that, right. that fee. You want so. to put on a good front anyhow. Absolutely. And uh, how old is your daughter? Now she's 11. Does she have any interest in, in books? I mean, she's, other than to read them. Yeah, she does love reading them. She, you know, she actually has kind of a good eye, but I don't think that she has uh, ambitions in the book trade in any, you know, in any very. Not I mean, yet. I don't think. She, yeah, she's eleven. So, um, I actually have made a point of not really taking her to book fairs because I didn't want her to, you know, 
to associate, you know, to be bored or to feel like, oh, now we're going to this. But she is going to come to opening night at the Armory because that, I feel like, you know, she was there from the very beginning and she was always a big booster. So she's excited about about that. That'll be well, fun. You know, there's a lot of, uh, we, we, what do we, call, we call them bibliomites. <laughs> and there's a lot of, like, 8 to 12-year-olds who run around various book fairs offering to... Uh, to clean your glass case or get I know, but soda. I think Ella Aiken has a, I think she has a lock on that concession. Yeah, I don't she, know if she's going to let Lily in. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, you, you, you got to make inroads somehow. It's true. Well, I'll see. Tell, I'll see competition what... is good. <laughs> but she, she's, uh, she works very hard at her, at her craft. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to having her there. And, uh, and she's, you know, she's very patient. I mean, she has spent you know, 10 hours in the Caliban warehouse in Pittsburgh, just, you know, entertaining herself wow. while I, you know, go through the shelves. And, um, you know, she patiently, you know, reads novels in foreign bookshops while I go through things. You know, she just, she, she hangs with it. I'm very, very lucky, actually, that yeah. uh, she's patient with she's it. She's not pulling at you saying, Ma, when uh, are I'm so bored. I'm so bored. No, she really doesn't do that at all. She's a, she's a good kid. She sounds like a good kid. Yeah, she is. So here you are. You're going to do your first book fair, which is a, a major one in New York City. You're getting yourself all psyched up and, and prepared. Do you have any expectations? I mean, the, you know, the expectation that I have is that I'll have a chance to say hello to a lot of people that I haven't had a chance to say hello to since I left Bowman because mm -hmm. they don't buy from me, and that's, you know, I'm not in their orbit in any way. Yeah. Now I will be visible again in this new incarnation, so that's exciting. Um, even if they don't become customers, just to see them again and say hello and reconnect. Yeah. Um, so I, I look forward to that, and I look forward to being able to buy during setup, which has, of course, not been something I've been able right. to do, and that's, you know, that's a disadvantage. So I look forward right. to um, being able to, you know, participate fully in the trade in a way that these past four years, you know, it's been a bit of a probationary period in some ways. So I'm looking forward to just someone today said, oh, you're going to sit at the big kids table now. And I said, yeah. That's, <laughs> is there a big kids table? Our, I guess, I, well, I guess the Armory's it. <laughs> oh, I guess that, yeah, I guess that is the big kids table. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and so I, I mean, in terms of money, I mean, I, I'm working very hard to make my display good and to have things other people don't have and that are really great. Um, so I certainly hope that people will buy them and then I will have money and it will be a successful fair. But honestly, even if it's not successful in that way, even if I lose money doing the armory, I still feel like what I will gain from doing the armory is worth doing. It's yeah, worth pressing it to the go. Flesh. So I mean, yeah, that's, that's really uh, showing up and just being present and that's right. Waving the flag. Exactly. Still here. Still here. Right here. Still, and, and planning to be here for a long, long I time. I'm not going anywhere. There I am. Uh, um, you're going to be able to have time to scout those little shadow shows that they're. I'm going to. I'm going to try to. Um, yeah. I mean, because you know they'll be open. I mean, you know there are two of them. Yeah. Right? And they're the same morning. So I will. Um, you know, I'll do my best to hit as much as I can. I mean, I you know have been doing the. Um, the shadow shows in New York for the past four years, so I know what they're like, and I yeah. certainly have bought well at them, you know. So I, I hope to do it again. 